welcome. Last talk of the day, or at least in this room. Um, I'm going to talk about ray tracing, which means a hands-on look at ray tracing in games extended edition. I wanted the extended edition on the title. Unfortunately, that didn't make it to the booklets or the TV screens outside, but it is very much so the extended edition. Okay? Uh, because this is based on the talk I did at GDC at the Learning Theater um, two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, I can't remember, time disappears. But I went back from GDC, I had a couple more meetings with the uh, ray tracing engineering team, and there was a lot of new information that came forth from that. So here's a one hour version that goes a lot further in optimization and performance. So this is not necessarily about how to make pretty graphics with ray tracing, which is what most people focus on, what most people want to do, which is totally understandable. But as a game developer, I've wanted to know, how does this impact my workflow? Right? How does this impact asset creation? Where is ray tracing fundamentally different from uh, a rasterize and what we've been doing for the past few decades? What do we have to pay attention to? How do you optimize for that? And so that's really the angle. I'm going to start off what I did at GDC, just explain to you how this works, uh, how to set it up just to get ray tracing up and running. But to be honest, there's not that huge amount to say there. Um, it's pretty straightforward. You enable a few options, you're good to go. Right? But the real thing comes to how do you really work with it? And that's the, the focus of the talk. Um, Can you hear me? Because that seems to disappear at times. It's disappearing, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so my name is uh, Shur Tiong. I'm the evangelist for the Unreal Engine in Europe and Middle East. Um, I lead the team, and essentially we do the, the outreach and the growth of the Unreal Engine in any any regards. It's a it's a mix between a lot of different departments and jobs. Um, but I've been using the Unreal Engine now for 20 years, so I have a long, long technical background. I made my own uh, games in my own studio, worked for AAA studios, I've done all kinds of different things. Um, so even though my job now mostly exists of emailing, unfortunately, um, I, I use these kind of opportunities to go back and you know, do, do something deep technical and really try to understand it, and then try to explain it in a way that makes sense. So I am not an engineer, I'm an artist, I'm a designer, or anything in that direction. I want really basic language. It's a ray, it starts here, it hits something, it goes there, and it's slow because of that reason. So expect that. I want this to be understandable. Because to be honest, I don't understand it myself if I don't do that. Okay. Um, good, let's start. So. What we're going to do is we're going to mix ray tracing with traditionally rendered elements. Okay, this is not going to be 100% ray traced because that's not realistic for games. What I want to have here is a case. This is how you would see ray tracing in the next half a year or a year in games, which is not going to be 100% ray traced. It's going to be a mix. Um, so we're going to use soft shadows and reflections primarily. I will have a brief word about translucency, but I'll skip forward on that quite fast. Brief word about aim and occlusion and global elimination as well. And then again, a lot on optimization and performance. This is what we're going to build. Uh, so that's a demo that I set, put together. Um, so we'll have a train driving through a subway station, essentially. And we'll get back to that later on. Let's intro some of this first. Uh, and before we start in the editor, what we have supported in 4.22 now is we've got soft shadowing for all types of lights. Um, we've got reflections. They were very well implemented. Um, we got aim and occlusion. Uh, we got a first pass global illumination. And that should be noted, it is really a first pass. And it doesn't do radiosity. Okay? It's only the bouncing of light. And it's really, really heavy. Uh, translucency. Uh, Image-based lighting in general. Clear coat materials are supported. And we actually have geometry lots. If you have watched my GDC talk, I pointed out that geometry lots are not supported. Meanwhile, or you know, around the time of GDC, they are now supported. So that came in as well. And we support static and skeletal meshes and some B basic BSP support and Niagara particles. Um, what we therefore don't support is we do not support world position offset. If you have foliage, grass or something that's moving in the wind, that's a tricky one. You can do that, but ray tracing the reflections, for example, simply will not show that the grass is moving. Okay? Uh, landscapes are not yet supported. That's coming in in 4.23, most likely. Instance meshes... That's cutting out again. Can you... Instant meshes and foliage. It's, I can take out my phone, but it's probably not it. Um, instant meshes and foliage are not yet supported. Again, you can use it. It just will not appear in any reflections or no shadows will be cast from it, etc. Uh, cascade particles will never be supported because we're phasing out cascades. Uh, splines not supported and it's not multi-GPU. This keeps cutting out. Uh, it's not multi-GPU. We're working on that, but it's surprisingly difficult to get this to work multi-GPU. Okay, So it's only a single GPU that can run ray tracing right now, but it's coming in the future. Uh, and also want to point out, 
what you, what you really, really want to do is you want to do full-on path tracing. You want to do that. And we're absolutely nowhere near that level. So in fact, I can show you really quickly in the editor here, just for fun. Uh, and there's actually a path tracing option in here. And what that does is this. It builds up the scene, literally, as you would expect from a full-on path tracer. This is the real deal. And you can see this does not run particularly fast. Okay? This is where you really want to go to. You want to get to a point where you no longer rasterize anything. The entire thing is path trace. All of the bounce lighting, everything is dynamic and path trace. If I take a prediction, five years, ten years from that point. Okay. Meanwhile, we're doing hybrids. So let's get going. Uh, first of all, we need to enable ray tracing. That means we need a, D, uh, we need a DXR compatible 3D card. Um, we need Windows 1809 or Neo, which is the last major Windows 10 upgrade. It doesn't work without that last major upgrade. And we need to run it with DirectX 12. So it only runs in DirectX 12. In my shortcut here, and it's going to be very small for you to read probably, but it says dash DX12. So we're running the editor in DirectX 12. And having done that, in the project settings, I simply enable ray tracing and compute skin cache, and that's it. Right, so if you look here for ray tracing, ray tracing enabled. If you enable that, it also automatically asks you for compute skin cache, I believe, support compute skin cache as a requirement for ray tracing, but that's it. So right now, we have the editor up and running in ray tracing. Um, you can see the performance here, too. It runs surprisingly well. It's obviously a decent computer, uh, but it runs really surprisingly well. And that's going to be a thing that's going to a team that's going to come back. This this is much more realistic to use in today's with today's hardware than you might imagine. Um, so to set up some basic ray tracing here, we've got a point light, got a character, got a shadow. This is not ray traced. There is a section, uh, a setting, sorry, in the properties of the light that says cast ray trace shadow. It's that easy. You say yes, you have ray trace shadow. Okay, it's very straightforward. Uh, in fact, it's enabled by default. I had it disabled for the demo. Uh, the softness of the shadow is controlled by the light source, the source radius of the light. So it's 16. Look, if I make it zero, it's very defined again, right? And the larger the number, the softer it gets. So you can get, you can control how large the light is. It's very straightforward, easy to do. Um, let me disable this for a moment. Similarly, so, you can do this with uh, spotlights, for example, just to take a different kind of light here for a moment. So here's a spotlight. You can see it casts these very harshly defined shadows. They're a little bit jaggy as well. These are not ray trace shadows. Again, same thing. I enable it there. I get soft shadows, soft ray trace shadows. That's it. Okay. Uh, There's nothing special to add there. Uh, but that brings us to rectangular lights. So rectangular lights we've added in, I don't know, Unreal Engine 4.18, I think, I can't remember entirely, about a year ago when we did the first version of ray tracing. What we showed at GDC a year ago with ray tracing, we completely rewrote that, by the way. So that's why it took a year for this to get re, uh, released. So this is version 2. Rectangular lights have been in the engine for a while, but they never fully worked. Because in order to do rectangular lights well, you need ray tracing. Because you can't calculate the shadows of a rectangular light otherwise. Um, and we've extended them a little bit for this first ray tracing release. So if I add in a rectangular light here, you can see what it does. Let's set it to movable. You can see already it is a nice soft light we've got over there. Um, essentially, the source width and height controls obviously how large it is. If it's very small, I get a very concentrated shadow again. And then I can define the light to be whatever size I want. We also got these, uh, a little bit of an edge to it in 422. That's controlled by barn door angle or barn door length. And that is essentially helping you control the uh, how, it, how it falls off. You can see, instead of, instead of having a very strongly defined line here, where, if I put it back here, sorry, hold on, like that, it's a very strongly defined line where the rectangular light is present. You can redefine that a little bit with barn door angle and do something like that. But that's it. Uh, there's one other really cool property, so, and that is source texture. And that's actually nothing to do with ray tracing. So you can use this even without ray tracing. You can use the rectangular lights without ray tracing, but if you use them with dynamic lighting, by the way, the shadows will be completely incorrect. Uh, but for example, here, on this tube light on the ceiling, you can see we have a rectangular light that matches the shape, the rough shape of the two tube lights. Let me enable that. Get light, obviously. Uh, but it has a source texture, which is mimicking those two tube lights. So by doing that, not only is the light actually cast from that texture, so it's more accurate, like it's, it's actually two cylinders giving light, or two, or two lines giving light, uh, but it also gets reflected in the, well, in the reflections. So if you look in the wall, you can see right there, we got that. That is the texture. 
that is not this. That is not the emissive material you're looking at. That is the actual texture. If I clear this out, it gets brighter because there's more white pixels without having the texture present. But you see, and it might be a little bit hard to see, it's, this is just a rectangle you see in the reflections. So it also improves your reflections. It actually makes the light fixtures show up in the reflections. Yeah. And again, that doesn't really have anything to do directly with ray tracing. Um, now, we've seen point lights and spotlights. Uh, what I've done in this environment is I've done a lot of mixing. And this is what I mean. It's really a hybrid, right? This is not the, the real environment. This is my test environment. I'll switch to the real level in, in a few minutes. But just if you look at the level without lighting, this is the level. Uh, all of these lights floating around are really low intensity ambient lights, for example. They're all static. I just baked the whole thing. In fact, in the image that you saw, most of the lights have been baked, except for a few hero lights, if you want to call it like that. Those are ray traced. So that's how I'm combining it. Most of it is just traditionally lit, but a few lights, really important ones, are all ray traced. And then the reflections are ray traced on top of it. So that's definitely the way forward for the time being, and that gives you really good performance as well, obviously. Um, but you also got skylights and directional lighting. Uh, I have an indoor environment, so there's not a huge amount I can say about those here. But I've got a little bit of an outdoor area here with teapots, really cool. So just to show you what would happen if I were to add them, here's a directional light. But it's a movable as well, it doesn't really matter. But the same thing, it has a setting here, cost rate ray shadow, and it has a source, uh, uh, source uh, soft angle. And that's basically it. Okay, so there's not too much to it. Sorry, it's that one rather, not this one. It's the source angle. You can see now it softens out, that's it. That's the directional light. Skylight, same thing. There's really not too much about setting this up. You can switch this on the fly as well, by the way. You can easily build a game that supports ray tracing. You just, just turn off the properties or some of the rendering features, and you have it scalable. It can go from ray tracing to non-ray tracing. There's nothing too particular about it. Um, Skylight does not have cost ray trace shadow enabled by default. I can enable that, but you can see this is considerably more noisy. So some of this is definitely work in progress. This is version one. You probably need at least two, three, four Unreal Engine releases to really get it to a proper state. Could you ship a game right now using the current implementation? Probably not entirely recommended, I would say. Uh, but what you can do, and this is the most important part, is you can see it how it would work, and you can look at what the impact would be on your content, and then base your decisions on that and, and roll along with it over the next year or so. Okay. There's also a setting here, if the autosave is on. Um, it says samples per pixels for ray tracing. If I increase that, well, that is how many pixels we cost. And obviously, we get rid of the noise because it gets much finer. It does impact performance. Not in this simple test scene, but that would have had a considerable impact on performance, of course. So it depends a little bit on, on what you're looking for, how much performance you're willing to give. Okay. But by default, this one is currently a bit noisy and will probably work it out uh, in a later version. Good. And I have a, one really interesting picture here. I got this one. So this is that same outer environment with lots of teapots. Right. The top one is Cascader Shadow Maps, so this is completely nothing to do with ray tracing. The bottom one is Ray Trace Shadows. Directional light, bunch of teapots, nothing else there. This runs at 52 frames per second for Cascader Shadow Maps. The Ray Trace one runs at 73 frames per second. Okay. There's a really important message there is that ray tracing is not necessarily slower. It could in fact be faster than what we've been doing before. It really depends on what you're building and how you're building it. And that is a really important thing to take away. So what we think might happen is that um, we're probably going to see ray trace shadows perhaps on directional lights first, because there's only one directional light, so that's ray traced, but all the other lights might continue to be just regular dynamic shadows, something like that. Um, and the reason why this is faster in this particular case, by the way, is because these teapots are high poly. There are about 100,000 polygons or so for each teapot. Cascader shadow maps does not like that. It's sensitive with polygon count. Ray tracing does not care about the polygon count in this, for this particular uh, uh, example. So there is a point at which ray tracing starts to catch up because it gets exponentially worse kind of for the, the cascaded shadow maps where ray tracing just doesn't care about the polygon count. Okay? So that's what happens. And also, one really uh, nice thing with um, ray traced uh, directional light, you can see if I do this. Normally, if you wouldn't use ray tracing, what would happen? is that the shadows would fade out, right? You've got this, this common problem as you have it in games. At some point, if you're far enough away, you just lost your shadows. Ray tracing does not have a range. You will never have a minimum range. For example, if I go back here and say ray tracing enabled, you can see as long I can go as far as, uh, away as I want, it has no range. So that's a major benefit. You will never have that, that, 
really rather annoying fading of shadows anymore on outer environments. Good. Um, so let's move on to introduction uh, to uh, the reflections. I'm going to switch level to the real level. Okay, so here's the actual level. Uh, most of this is baked. What's not baked are the three red lights. There's a red light there, there, and there. And there's a train going to come passing through the tunnel that is not ray traced either. That is ray traced, I'm sorry. Everything else is baked. But all the reflections are ray traced. Okay. And you can see at just how good the reflections are. If you, once you see this stuff, I can't unsee it. I cannot go back to non ray traced reflections right now. Okay. This is the ray traced reflection. That is absolutely hair sharp. Okay. That is the, ap that is the reflection. If, the, if you move, you get a little bit of jagginess and noise. You can see there's a bit of artifact. It's not entirely smooth, right? But if you compare the two, I mean, there is, you cannot see the difference. So it's really, really, really cool. Um, now, there's a couple of problems here, though. You can see there's a lot of black pixels, right? The reason why there's a lot of black pixels right now is because by default, and this is a, a good thing to do out of a performance perspective, the number of bounces is set to one. So there will only be a single reflection bounce, which for for games, please do that. Please don't do what I'm going to do now, because you will kill your performance. But, out of example. In the post-process volume, we've added a number of the ray tracing options. Not all of them, but a, com a couple of the common ones. So the ray, trace ref ray tracing reflections, maximum bounces, that's set to 1. Obviously, I'm going to set it to 2. I get this, right? So you compare this over here. You kind of see what happens, right? 1, 2, and you can keep on going 3. But obviously, I mean, frame rate is currently 28. You know, at one, I was at 120. I mean, it takes a little bit of performance. Um, so what we're going to do in the, future, in the future, by the way, is because this is heavy, and this is also a problem. So we're thinking of doing a fallback, where the second reflection is going to use screen space reflections or the reflection captures. So that's going to be the fallback. So that costs pretty much no performance, but we also avoid having pitch black shadows, uh, pixels in there. So that's probably going to come in in 4.23 to make this a bit better. Um, there's one other thing that you want to wanna highlight with reflections. I've got a mirror over here. Let me move the mirror up. And if you look at the shadows, you can see that's not the same, right? Uh, so the shadows in the reflection are a bit problematic to do. Uh, there is a setting that controls the shadows in reflections. In fact, it says here, ray tracing reflections, shadows, it's set to harsh shadows, harsh shadows. I can obviously disable the shadows. That would be good for performance. You might want to do that in a game in early adaptions. Doesn't look very good, though, if you do that. Uh, you can set it to soft shadows, area shadows, which would be the preferred option, but it's rather noisy. And this is, has technical reasons as well with the denoiser and what we can do in reflections and so on. So, you know, again, it's work in progress, and some of this needs further research and development. So harsh shadows is the default. Um, so we looked at soft shadows and max bounces, but reflections, as you've already kind of felt, I think, it has a really big impact on performance. The soft shadows are surprisingly good. You've seen that with the directional light. Uh, I could have placed the, basically, I could have replaced all of the lights in my, my train station, my subway station, with ray-traced soft-shadowed lights, and performance would have probably been okay. okay. So that's fine, but the reflections, that is immediately, bam, you lose 90% of your performance. Um, so we're going to get back to the reflections soon, because there's a lot, of, a lot to say about optimization and why it takes performance. So I'll skip that for now. Let's cover a couple of the other intro things. Uh, translucency. Let's bring in a train. Got a train sequence here. And I just remembered, I forgot to show you one really cool thing with the soft shadowing. I'm going to open up the other level in a second, just to show you that. Uh, we've got a train here, and it has uh, gloss the windows. Right. And you can see the windows, they don't show any reflections. In fact, if I look away, I do get reflections, but those are your screen space reflections that fade in. Right? Uh, by default, or you can turn on or turn off the reflections. In fact, in the post-process volume, move this away a little bit, it says here translucency, and it says type raster. Okay? So if I set that to ray tracing, you get actually ray trace reflection on the gloss. So you've got to enable that. Uh, uh, manually. It's a special case. Translucency is difficult. It is not entirely done either yet. You can see, again, there's black pixels here, but even if I would have set the max bounce to 2, it doesn't actually affect this. We can't get rid of the black pixels in ray trace translucency right now. Again, work in progress. Uh, so feel free to experiment with ray trace translucency. 
if it works better or not. There is one uh, setting here somewhere for um, re uh, refraction. I would enable that, Look, if uh, disable it. In my scenario, if I enable it, it looks kind of weird. It doesn't really quite work. It looks a bit strange. So feel free, feel free to experiment with that and see if it's better or worse with it enabled or disabled. But I'll have it off also for the sake of performance. You know, I'll sacrifice the glass in order to gain some extra performance. But let me, before I continue, and go to aiming and occlusion and, um, and GI, I would really like to show you the one thing that I just uh, forgot to show. I'm going to switch back to the other level, because this really shows you how cool ray tracing is. If I go back here, if I disable that light or kill it, uh, so it's essentially almost entirely dark, I switch this to detail lighting. Let me go full screen. Oh, actually, let me quickly get the train in first. Full screen, and here's the train. This is just awesome to see. Just a soft shadowing as the train drives by through the platform, and you get this. I mean, for comparison, I can disable the ray tracing, soft shadows, somewhere in here. So you have a lot of R commands. You're going to see this come back in a second as well as I start doing more in the optimizations. But I can take the sh shadows and say the shadows are zero. This is non-ray trace. This is what we're used to, right? And if you just see this again, it's just so incredibly unrealistic. It's so nice to see this switch around to this, the nice soft shadows you've got. In fact, you can go even further and do following. I can say that this very large uh, light panel here, which is a big rectangular light, I'm going to enable that with ray tracing, and then I'm going to see what happens. Okay, so it's currently set to affect world false. Now we've enabled it. Obviously, this costs shadow. And you can see here also there is no global illumination enabled right now. I have that disabled, so this is all pitch black. So there is a couple of things to be aware of there. But just take a look at what happens as a train occludes the light. So I'm going to position my camera here. Let's do it like this. Right. So train is coming in. Let's let it drive through. As it passes away, it really gradually smooths in the light on the surface again. It's pretty much dark now. And as it passes away, you get this really subtle, soft, Brightening, that is just cool to see this kind of stuff. Okay, You would have never been able to do it in any other way but ray tracing. Anyway, I just wanted to go back to show you that. My colleagues are complaining that ever since I saw with ray tracing, I have to keep telling them every day just how cool someone is this, this stuff is. I think they're getting annoyed. <laughs> um, good, so there's aim and occlusion as well. I'm not really using that. I disabled it here, in fact. But again, feel free to experiment with it. It's uh, a lot of this controlled again over here in as a as a CVAR. So there is somewhere here R dot ray tracing dot aim occlusion. You know, I can just uh, for fun I can do this. I don't see a difference, right? It depends on the content you've got. I got a rather dark interior subway station thing. If you got an outdoor environment that's rather bright, you have snow or something. I mean, it might do better, but in my case, it disabled it, gained a little bit of extra performance. It's not expensive, just gain a little bit of extra performance. Another thing you can do is then the global illumination, which I will not enable, but just to point out. There is a R.ray tracing global illumination. Experiment with it, but again, it's really heavy, it is noisy, it's work in progress. But you can kind of see what might be possible in a couple of months or in a year or so from now. Right. Um, now, we're going to start getting more and more in optimization. So let me get, just take a step back and talk a little bit about, um, you know, just a big picture, right? In a big picture, in order of performance relative to how much payback you're getting for the expense that you're making, shadows are by far the best thing to do. They're relatively cheap and they're very visible. So shadows are really the first thing to look into. Reflections are really expensive, but they're also really visible. So probably, in my opinion, they're the second thing to probably start moving into. Translucency, I'm personally not using at all at the moment. I think it might be very visible, but it's also kind of specific. I think you can kind of work around it often, so it's a case-by-case -case basis. Aim at occlusion, again, case-by-case -case basis. It's pretty cheap, but personally, in this environment, I'm not noticing it much benefit, so case-by-case -case basis. And global elimination, super cool, super expensive. Basically, you cannot use this right now. That's what, in, in practice, you cannot. So that needs more time. So that gives you a little bit of an idea there. Um, you use a post-process volume and a lot of the CVARs that you type at the bottom to control this. Um, and you can use Stat GPU and GPU Profiler to look into it. Now, I'm going to show you at the end of this presentation, I'm going to show you what we're doing for 423, which is more than this. You can see right now in Stat GPU, you get some basic stuff like ray tracing reflections and something else here, some uh, ray tracing top-level 
uh, acceleration structure, aim and occlusion. You can see a little bit of it, but it's very simple. You can also see ray tracing reflections takes 24 milliseconds out of 35. Just a little bit expensive. Okay? Um, but we'll get back to There's going to be more stats coming in 423 to help you get an idea and profile of this. You can use uh, Insight from NVIDIA, for example. It completely supports ray tracing. Uh, if you're more technically, technically inclined, you can analyze quite a bit of it. Uh, likewise, NVIDIA has a lot of tools that they release. They're all ray tracing ready, so you can use all of those tools to really understand what is the ray tracing hitting, you know, what are the rays hitting, where is the cost going, but they're not the most straightforward to use if you're, you know, if you're not on the engineering level. I would personally go rather in this direction, and that's what I'm going to do. So as an artist or a developer or a designer or someone who's not an engineer, how do you actually use this stuff, okay, besides checking tick boxes? Let's start simple. Got, uh, I got a couple of basic options here. And I got screen percentage, max ray distance, and max roughness. I've set these somewhat hacky, but it's for the sake of the demo. In the level blueprint, I specified some of these. So now we're waiting for a blueprint to open. It's fun that ray tracing goes this fast, but opening blueprints seems particularly complicated. It might be that it's on a different monitor, but I don't think it is. No, it's not. It didn't even open, apparently. I clicked. Go on. OK, good. Um, so here's what I have in here. I've turned off the dynamic mesh instancing that we added in 4.22 just for the sake of displaying a particular feature later on, so ignore that. Uh, turn off ray tracing, aim occlusion there, zero. I set R dot ray tracing reflections max ray distance, and that's a good one. It gives you a very small performance boost. It's not going to do much, but it doesn't hurt adding it. So what you're doing there is you're limiting the, the rays from reflections to a maximum length. So if, for example, you have a long train tunnel, you're making sure that some of the, rain, the rays can never just keep on going until basically at the end of the tunnel where you wouldn't be able to see them anyway, anyhow anymore, right? So you can limit, you can cull the, the distance. Gives you a slight performance boost. It's not going to be much, but it's, it's one thing you can do. You can use R dot reflection screen percentage 50. Essentially, obviously, you reduce the reflection quality to 50%. That does a lot to performance, as you might imagine. It also doesn't look very good. So again, Pros and cons, you've got to see it case by case how it goes. Right now, you get a little bit of a rendering artifact when you use it as well, which kind of adds up to the, well, it's not super useful right now. But as we're solving this and improving it, that's probably going to be a good one to use. You can have ray trace reflections, just not at 100% quality for performance. Uh, we got sort materials, and I'm going to get back to that in a second in one of the next slides, because that's, that could be a really important one. And that's part of a really fundamental understanding of how ray tracing works. Okay, and then you can do other things. For example, you can disable the height fog in the reflections. Gives a slight, slight improvement. You can do it for translucency as well. So you have a lot of those kind of settings that you can set. Again, max ray distance for translucency, etc. So that's where I would start. Set a couple of those settings. But that only goes that far, right? Where you're really going to start getting major improvements in performance is when you start looking at the materials. The materials in combination with reflections. That's, that takes everything. Um, so the roughness, for example. What I did here is I built this improvised debug view mode. We're probably going to look into perhaps adding this to the engine somehow you know, as a standard feature. And what I did, again, is very much so improvised. So it's not entirely accurate, but it's going to illustrate what happens. This is my debug view mode. It's just a blendable I made. In fact, since we have the time, let me just open this up, just give you an idea. That's what I hacked together. It's, it's again, really definitely improvised, right? Uh, I take the roughness, and based on the roughness value, I assign three different colors to it. And then I try to do the same with normals, but it didn't work very well. So, um, Well, it was hard to do. <laughs> um, but what happens here? So the different colors. Green is obviously the fastest to render. So the green pixels are the best, as it implies. The yellow pixels are medium, and red is slow. But why are those three different colors there? Because of the normal value values and the roughness values. Uh, it affects ray coherency, and the way ray coherency is affected in terms has a huge impact on the way the, the, the hardware has to render the rays and calculate the rays. So if a surface is 100% rough, the ceiling, for example, is very rough, um, if a ray hits that, we just kill it. Because you were going to argue, you wouldn't be able to see a reflection on that, it's not very reflective. So instead of rendering, you know, calculating the ray tracing for those pixels, we're going to have those pixels fall back on regular reflection captures. So everything that's green is not actually using ray tracing, which is obviously fast. So 100% roughness, very fast. Uh, everything that's yellow is using ray tracing, but it has a very simple calculation to do. The ray coherency is very, is, uh, is very high. 
So if you have a surface that's 100% reflective, which the puddle of water is, then as the ray hits it, it just hits it and it bounces and that's it. Easy, right? So if the next ray hits it as well, the next ray comes in as well, it hits it, it bounces, it goes away. It's easy. So all of the rays are kind of doing the same thing, so we can batch that. And I'm going to get back to that in the next slide. This is what I didn't say at GDC. I had a simple explanation there. This is the complicated one. So as it hits it, it all goes in the same direction, and that impacts what it hits in the, in the, in the distance. That's the next slide. But that's ray coherent, a, great, a large ray coherency. The red pixels, though, are roughness values between, between zero and wherever your threshold point is. And the threshold point is the point at where it starts going green. So if you have a roughness of 0 0.4, say, those pixels will render a lot slower than roughness zero. And that's what I'm trying to visualize here. So I went through my environment and I had to analyze the materials and I started changing some of the materials. For example, the pipes I didn't change, but to be good and correct, I kind of have to go back and change the roughness values of the pipes and I would actually gain performance. So what you're going to get in games in the next uh, year or so, you're going to get very shiny reflective games, not only because the artists really want to show off what, what ray tracing does, but also because it literally runs faster. Okay. Now, that's not the full story. Let me turn this off, because the full story goes like this. Um, it's about ray coherency, right? So if it hits a rough surface, and this also goes for normals, if you have strong normals, the same thing would happen. When it hits a rough surface, the ray is going to be bounced away in a different direction, so it's going to change course. That's the problem. That means that all the rays that hit, they start going in different directions. So your rays start to scatter in all kinds of different directions. Um, and therefore, since they're now all in different places, right? if the ray hits the table, it's going to probably go to the ceiling or somewhere there. It's going to hit a lot of different parts of the ceiling. That is slow. We can't batch that together anymore. The hardware is batching that in groups of a few dozen rays at the same time. It's kind of like render states. right? If you're changing the material, the hardware has to change render state. There's a cost associated with that. That's where this comes from. That means that the mesh fragmentation is the real cause for this issue. Because as these rays who've hit the table go back up and they hit the ceiling, if the ceiling consists of a lot of different meshes with a lot of different materials, every ray is going to hit a different material on the ceiling. So this ray is now unique from the ray that's right next to it. They hit different materials. So they have to change state in between them. Um, if the material is very reflective, all the rays go in the same direction. So they're much more likely to hit the same mesh in a distance, which speeds up. That's where this really comes from. Um, so the more shaders you hit, the slower it is. That has a lot of content implications. So it's not about draw calls, it's about the number of shaders in the environment and where your rays are going. I built a small test case that tries to visualize this. Now, it's been a week since I tried this, so I hope that my test survives, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have the, the courage to do this live and show you exactly what I mean. So I hope it survives, okay? Just bear with me. I have a light in this cube that I made. Okay, light. Uh, this cube is a little bit of a, is a steep one in the middle. It's a lot of different meshes with a lot of different materials. That's what it is. Every color, there's eight or nine different materials here, and it's basically lots of cubes placed through a blueprint next to each other. Um, and also the problem is this computer is so powerful, it doesn't really help showing performance. So I'm going to try to bump up, let's see what I can bump up. The post process, the two reflection bounces or something probably does it. Let's try to do that. Um, I actually want less performance. Maybe. I mean, it's going to be hard, for, hard to read for you. Probably it's 49 frames per second. I can probably go full screen. No, that's now 21 frames per second, right? This is a, a kind of a bad scenario for ray tracing because we have a rough surface. You can see there's a normal map there, so the, the rays are going to get scattered. And every time as the ray gets scattered, they're all going to hit lots of different materials, because the whole thing is built up of different materials. This is kind of a terrible scenario. So you can see the performance is 21. But if I take this cube and I have an option here that says use instancing, okay, it does the same thing. The geometry is exactly the same. The number of draw calls is the same, but it runs at 45 frames per second. So we've doubled the frame rate just because of that, because all of these instances come from the same shader underneath the surface. So all of the rays are hitting the same shader. It's significantly faster. Um, and this is only using a single material. And that also runs 45 frames per second. You can see it's the same geometry again, just assign the same red material to everything. So that has the same impact as only using instances. Uh, 
Um, so what you ought to do, and I did not do this in my demo, because I realized this after I built it, so it was a good test case for me as well. In my demo, I took in content that we had laying around from previous examples. Um, none of this was set up, set up correctly, so what I have now is actually raw, I can get more performance out of it. I have a lot of unique materials. My pillars is an actual material. My ceiling is a different material. My floor is a different material. Everything is a material, not a material instance. That does not help. If I would have redone all of the content from scratch and I would have done the whole thing with one master material or two or three, like a limited number of master materials, and then everything is a material instance with as few material instance permutations as possible, that would have been significantly faster. Like this just doubled the frame rate in my example. Okay? So that's what you've got to do. You've got a limited number of uh, unique materials. And if you do that, in the extreme case, it's the roughness the normal and the roughness impacts of the materials actually have almost no impact anymore on performance. But in a very fragmented scene, the normal and roughness, roughness values of the materials have a significant impact on performance. Good. Um, but So we try to fix that automatically, but it's not easy to do. So we have a command here called ray, ray tracing.reflections.sortmaterials, and that's, that's designed to minimize the shader impact. So let's go back here. Let's turn this back off, right? So here's back worst case scenario running at 22 frames per second. And let's try to do this, sort materials. It's disabled by default. If I enable it, it takes a bit of a time to refresh the whole thing. It's coming in. Right, it's still 25 frames per second. Oh, sorry, my bad. Ooh. I've pressed something. And I've pressed undo, which is really dangerous. Probably don't do that. Um, let me try this again, just to compare. Sort materials. So that's 0, 22. So you can experiment with that a little bit and see what kind of impact it makes. 25. So go from 22 to 25. The thing is that it's really case dependent, case by case dependent. Uh, what it tries to do is that as it casts the, the rays, it tries to find the rays that are going to hit the same shader and then group them together in one batch. So it tries to sort the rays as they're being cast. It doesn't always work, so it's a setting to experiment with. Uh, in general, the whole mat uh, material complexity has a big impact on ray tracing. You can test this with enable material zero. So if you were to do that in the environment, so let's go back um, to the actual level, and I type um, enable materials. Right, I was 30 frames per second, I'm now 120 locked, so I probably have way more. This shows you the impact. You can use this as a test. You can see, okay, just how much performance is actually lost to material-related ray tracing work. If you look in a mirror, for example, everything looks black, but the geometry is still there. You can kind of see there, the geometry is there. It's just all the materials are gone. So the reflections are ray traced, but just not with materials. And that has a huge impact on performance, too. In fact, because it has such a big impact on performance, there is another feature that we've added that can help you as an artist and, and a content developer you can kind of use this to, um, to improve things a little bit. And the performance is just quite bad here, so I'm going to take away my three bounces and do one bounce. Good. Um, we have a material version of this. I'm going to change the material that's on the, the, the bench. And this instance here, add the instance. Okay, it's going to compile the shader for a second. And if I now look in the mirror, I have a red bench. It's not red over there, though. So what you can do is you can make the reflection different from the actual uh, real world. And that has uh, performance imp uh, optimization implications. So here's the, um, the material. Sorry, that's the instance. Um, so what I did here is there is an option called ray tracing quality switch replace where you can say, if it's normal, do that, but if it's ray traced, use this. It only shows up in reflections or in the ray trace calculations, but again, it really helps with performance. For example, over here, we've got this whole arm doing stuff, and let's say that you would never see that. For example, let's say you have detail normal mapping. You don't want to get the detail norm normal mapping to show up in reflections. Save a bit of performance there, so have a branch there that essentially strips out. If it's ray traced, just use 0 0.5. If you do this well across all of your materials, that has a significant impact, again, on performance. So I've done this here and there as, again, but the content wasn't, I didn't build this content from the ground up, so to try to mo start modifying everything at a later stage was rather annoying. So think of this early on. Good. 
uh, mass materials are an issue in ray tracing because when we have mass materials, we've got to we've got to check the material as the ray passes through, right? We've got to, as the ray travels through the world, it starts to start evaluating the material and the textures in order to figure out where it can pass through. That is a lot slower. So mass materials are slow. Try to avoid them where possible. Uh, in 4.23, we're going to do some optimizations. It's going to improve, but it will remain more expensive than non-mass surfaces. And that's not including regular overdraw and those kind of issues you would regularly have with mass uh, materials. Uh, Geometry-wise, in general, kind of the same thing is true. If you have a geometry with a lot of small holes and spaces, uh, let's say vegetation, fences, anything like that, um, the ray tracing is slow because as the ray travels through the world and it goes through a, a narrow space, as it goes through, it needs to check the nearby geometry. So you've got a lot of narrow holes. It needs to do a lot of checking on the geometry as it travels through the world. That is slower. Uh, so in general, fixed solid, solid shapes are the fastest. Um, you know, architecture is very well suited for ray tracing for that matter. Um, forest, nature, is definitely not. The reason there is mass materials and a lot of small holes. Um, and then there is polygon, the poly count in ray tracing. Um, so with static scenes, ray tracing actually handles uh, high polygon counts better than a rasterizer. That's the first interesting one. So it's actually very good with poly counts in general. Uh, what it does in ray tracing is we use an acceleration structure. We essentially use the bounding box of the mesh and we start creating some kind of bounding box hierarchy of the object. And we do this to avoid having to intersect rays against all the triangles. We don't want to check all the actual geometry. We're actually checking some kind of simplified um, uh, acceleration structure from that. Now that process is done for the, it's is basically cached. If you use a rasterizer, it has to convert this continuously, right? It has to convert, uh, the 3D model has to rasterize that result continuously frame by frame. But in ray tracing, we only have to do this acceleration structure once. So high poly content is actually pos potentially slightly faster. And you can test this, you can run some tests, uh, you know, check it out. But it's potentially faster in ray tracing. But the problem is skin dynamic meshes, so characters or such, they do have to be continuously recalculated, so we have to create that acceleration structure continuously for every frame because those meshes are changing, changing. And that is considerably slower, in fact. So characters are slower to render, especially the higher poly they get in ray tracing, but static geometry tends to be much more neutral in, in terms of polygon count. Um, and the impact there is that it also takes a lot of memory. Um, so out of memory crashes are quite common in ray tracing. It is memory intensive. Uh, the acceleration structure takes about 84 bytes per triangle in some of our test cases. So that's what you're looking at. That adds up. Um, skin meshes, so characters and, and similar skeletal meshes, they have the biggest impact. But in general, anything, you know, the more high poly, the more this starts adding up. But Definitely characters have a huge impact. If you have a lot of characters you, and you enable ray tracing, it's likely this might crash with out of memory. And then that would be the, the reason. Um, and we do, ins we do support memory mesh instancing, by the way, just to point it out. So if you've got a high poly statue and you copy that statue four times in the level, it's only, you know, it's only converted in this acceleration structure once and stored in memory once. It's not per instance in the level. Uh, in 4.23, and running towards the end. In 4.23, we're also adding more performance stat, stats, just to bounce back to the earlier slide there. Uh, so this is work in progress, what we had, I think, on Monday. So it's, it comes in very hot. It's probably going to change by the time we release 4.23, but we added a ray tracing uh, stat that shows you a little bit about where the memory is going, because right now it's pretty much impossible to see how much you're spending on ray trace memory. Uh, and you can see some of, you know, for example, the number of triangles in all the acceleration structures, and you can kind of use that to start going through some of that. Good. And to wrap up, um, indoor is slower as well than outdoors, because if you have an indoor environment, the rays are always going to hit something. So we can never stop, we can never cull some of the rays. If you've got an outdoor environment, you're right, let's say it's just a flat space with a horizon in the middle, about 50% or so of the rays will disappear into the sky those will ca carry almost no cost. We simply stop the rays. So they're very cheap. The rays that hit something there, that's where the expense goes. Now, outer environments, you so therefore, um, you can just remove some of the rays. Indoor environments, you always hit something, right? So the most re uh, ray trace friendly environment would be an outdoor city architecture, and it's outdoors. The worst would be indoor, uh, a greenhouse translucency, 
it's indoors, and it's vegetation with a lot of holes. Okay? So that's the takeaway you can take home. Um, do not build greenhouses in ray tracing. Just don't. Don't build jungles either, please. Don't build jungles. Just build cities and deserts. It'll be fine. But you can try this in Unlined 422. It's really, really fun to play with and experiment with, I think. I had a great time building this, so enjoy. Thank you. Thank you.